Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Milgar School of Business and the World Affairs Council Tacoma Speaker Series. Uh, I'm Julia Chow, Associate Dean of the Milgar School of Business. Um, we are very excited for the opportunity to collaborate with the World Affairs Council Tacoma today on this panel discussion about global supply chains. Uh, we would also like to recognize the funding provided by Tacoma Creates in support of this program. At this time, I would like to invite Dr. Altof Merchant, the Gary E. and James A. Milgar Endowed Dean, for the Milgar School of Business to start the program. Please welcome Dean Merchant. Thanks so much, uh, Juliet, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's wonderful to see you uh, at this event. Um, this is a really exciting uh, event for me uh, because you know it signifies a lot of interesting things that we are going to be doing, and. Um, it's great to have a conversation on this really, really important topic. So today we are really uh, fortunate to have uh, eminent speakers, industry leaders who are part of this panel. Uh, we have the Port of Tacoma represented, uh, represent here, uh, Northwest Seaport Alliance, Provident uh, Health, Healthcare, Highline College, and the Milgard School of Business. So today you'll hear about insights of um, the impact of recent events that reshaped our thinking about global supply chains. And uh, we will also then focus on challenges and opportunities for maintaining resilience and sustainability uh, in, the in the regional supply chains. Now, this topic is really timely um, and relevant and important, uh, not only from an academic or uh, industry perspective, but for us as individual consumers. Um, we confront uh, challenges of, of trade, uh, new industries, AI, uh, technologies, and socio-political challenges. You know, we hear about uh, the challenges that are happening in the Middle East, in you know, pirates, and with China, and we talk about a lot of different trends and patterns happening all around the world, which influences um, industry and profitability, but also uh, how much we pay for things, right? Simple things like T-shirts and coffee and everything. So it's really, really important. And um, at the Milgar School of Business, supply chain management and logistics is the next frontier of academic offerings. So a little bit of uh, back into history. So three years ago, there was a contingent of alumni of Milgar School of Business, including Rick Miltmore, who approached me and, and encouraged me to start a program in supply chain management. So we are we started work around this area. We, should, we will be launching a Master of Science in Supply Chain Management and Logistics in the next year or so. And I think it's gonna be a really exciting program based on AI and based on analytics. And so it's gonna be really relevant, especially we have one of the top uh, ports in the country around, just around the corner. So I think it's gonna be really, really relevant. Another event I'm really excited about is the World Trade Conference, which we're putting together. And uh, Professor Stan Emmert is leading that. And we're gonna have key speakers and, and opinion leaders and decision makers who are gonna be participating. That's gonna be in October, so that's something which is coming soon. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge the work of Associate Dean Chow, who's worked with the World Affairs Council of Tacoma in, in putting this together. So at this time, I'd like to introduce the moderator of today's panel, Sam Kaplan, who will introduce the panelists. Sam is the director of uh, for the Center of Excellence for Global Trade and Supply Chain at Highline College and is an expert in supply chain. He's joining us via Zoom today, so that's, that's Sam, uh, because he has some medical emergencies. Uh, we appreciate his support and in spite of his health challenges, he's participating, so thank you very much, Sam, for your resilience, right? Uh, please join me in welcoming Sam and to this amazing panel and discussion on supply chain management. Yeah, thanks, thanks very much, uh, everybody. Good to see you all. I, I apologize again, I can't be there in person today. I, I managed to hurt my back uh, earlier in the week, uh, which has made driving a little bit difficult. Um, so if you see me wince at any point during the discussion, it's not because of anything any of the panel has said, it's because of my back. Um, so in the old days, global supply chains were mostly ignored by the general public were those key and crucial things that no one would pay attention to. They just took care of themselves. But then came the pandemic, and then when things didn't arrive on time on occasion, suddenly everybody was fixated on supply chains. 
I happen to think the supply chains did better than people realized during the pandemic, but nonetheless, for the first time in my life, people were paying attention to supply chains. And then every time I think supply chains are gonna go retreat back into the corner, resume their quiet, happy lives, a little bit like our 18 year old cat who goes to the heating pad on a couch in our family room, along comes another incident to bring us attention back to it. Unfortunately, tragically, this week, yesterday, the, the uh, ship that, uh, the container ship that hit the bridge in Baltimore, and now supply chains are back on the, on the headlines. So we're really fortunate to have a great group of experts here this afternoon to help us navigate these complicated issues. I'm gonna introduce them uh, and give you a little bit of information about them. And then they're gonna do some quick little information, some quick slides, each of them, and then I'll ask some questions, but even more important, you all get a chance to ask them some questions as well. So we'll start with the Commissioner Deanna Keller uh, for the Port of Coma and also Northwest Seaport Alliance managing member. I had the pleasure, honor, and fun to get to know Deanna last year when we were engaged with the project with some European ports. A uh, great leader for our region. She's been the Port of Coma Commissioner for the last six years. But she also brings a great swath of private sector experience from when she ran a plastics company for many years but also an educational experience as well. She was a principal in our schools and she's even a musician. I don't know if she's gonna to talk to us about that uh, today, but uh, that was maybe the most impressive thing about her to me. Um, she's on a bunch of different boards, a great community leader. Uh, so Deanna Keller with the Porter Tacoma Commission. Next on our, on our uh, uh, panel, someone I've known for a long, long time, Don Ju. Uh, we've been working together on various projects for many years which doesn't mean we're old, it just means we started when we were 10 years old. Uh, she's the lead for Northwest Seaport Alliance uh, on Chief Commercial Strategy Officer. Before that, she's worked at both the ports of Tacoma and Seattle. She worked at the Washington State Department of Commerce. Again, a great regional leader who's doing all sorts of things to make sure that one of our great assets for this region, the ports of our region, the Northwest Seaport Alliance, the Port of Tacoma and Port of Seattle are being successful. Uh, so uh, welcome, Tong. Looking forward to your comments shortly as well. And then we have uh, Rick Miltimore, who's the Chief Logistics Officer for Providence. Uh, Rick, I feel like I should ask you to send a team up here to help me with my back, but I'll refrain from doing that. Um, but he, he's uh, joined Providence St. Joseph Health team in 2015. and leads a the team there, as you can see on this slide. He's been had a great experience in a variety of places, uh, both at Weyerhaeuser, in World Vision, I actually want to ask you if you know, knew Scott Jackson from those days. I used to know Scott, he used to lead World Vision many years ago. Uh, great private sector experience and great uh, nonprofit experience. You can talk to us about supply chains. Rick, we're looking forward to your comments as well. And finally, but not uh, least, is Luana John, uh, who is Assistant Professor of Business Analytics at the, Mildred, at the University of Washington Tacoma. Uh, she brings great experience with research interests, as you can see, and things are right up the alley, but we'll learn about supply chain management, platform economy, and consumer behavior. So we've got both port experience, public experience, private sector experience, and academic experience on this, uh, on this uh, panel, as well as even musical experience. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Commissioner Keller to show some uh, information to us via these slides. Looking forward to it. Great, thank you very much, Sam. And <clears throat> Sam did a great job. Um, he was a consultant for the Port of Tacoma, took us on a trip to Antwerp, to Rotterdam, and to uh, Brussels, where we met with European Union leaders in maritime and logistics um, uh, industry as well, so that we could figure out what's the difference between the United States policies and what's the difference between Europe, European policies. And we each have our challenges, for sure. Um, so I'm here today to talk a little bit about um, some of the challenges that we have in the United States and is specifically here in the state of Washington. Uh, the first one, and you can see on the slide here, is the harbor maintenance tax. And what that is, is it creates, it's a federal program designed to um, charge, um, we call it about $100 per container or can that comes off of the ships. And all of these um, funds go into a federal fund that goes to dredging uh, ports that ha have shall shallower drafts. So basically, uh, the ports like the ports of Seattle and Tacoma that have deep water, that are deep water ports, those monies, we don't get to see those monies. And so they go off 
into federal government land and go to other um, probably smaller ports once that don't have uh, as deep of water as, as we do. And we think that the, the goal of this is wonderful to you know give that to them, but the, the problem that it is for us is that any time that you add a tariff or an additional tax, then um, it makes us it makes it more difficult for us to compete with our closest competitor, which is Canada, Prince Rupert and the Port of Vancouver. And um, so a lot of people, to shippers, will want to uh, avoid that kind of tax, and they will send their cargo up into Canada and then rail it down uh, into the United States, which uh, it's cheaper for them to do that. And we also know, and Tom can later tell you about that, that price is important for in our economy and um, wanting to make sure that uh, um, it, it makes it more difficult for us. The other part of it is that the Canadian government tends to fund their, um, their supply chain. Their ports are funded. Also, they uh, own their railroads. So currently right now, there's a rail system. They just completed it all the way down through from the ports of uh, Canada, Prince Rupert, and Vancouver, all the way down through the heartland of the United States and down into Mexico. And so their rail systems can also charge less because it's not a monopoly like our, some of our rail systems. Our rail systems are good, but they, um, uh, they, because they're the only show in town, they can charge a lot more money than the Canadian rail system can. So it makes it very difficult for us. Um, so what do we do to try and over you know, to over or to compensate for that is we try and, and develop best in class service. So we have people, um, Tom is, is, and her team is absolutely excellent at, at working with, um, you know, uh, getting more commercial business. They spend a lot of time and I don't know how they do it. Their bodies must be like totally worn out, but go to Asia, like you'll be on three trips this year uh, to Asia, one to Europe. Um, we go down to TPM. Uh, they also push the commissioners out in front and also meet with uh, business folks too to try and to show how important this is to the, our public because for, for your voice. So we want to make sure that uh, all of these shippers and beneficial cargo owners understand how important these ports are to us and, and should be to them as well. Um, you saw a little bit about my background in education, I spent 24 years in education as uh, an educator, actually. You heard I was a musician. I was a high school band director. I was a program administrator for the Puyallup School District and ran the music program there and then became a principal. And I think I met a parent who said, I think it's former Commissioner O'Malley, is that correct? Yeah, he's, his son was in my uh, elementary school and at Park Lodge Elementary, so small world. But my important thing that I wanted to bring to the Port of Tacoma was, and it was during COVID, knowing that a lot of people would be staying home and wanting to take a look at their career options, which they did. And so I thought we really need to assemble some ideas on how we can get more people into the maritime trade industry. And so um, I started, I joined uh, the workforce, I'm part of the Workforce Central Board. I'm on uh, uh, let's see, Tacoma Public Schools um, Career Advisory and Technical Advisory uh, Committee with them. Um, so have, have spent quite a bit of time trying to figure out how we can piece this together. Two years ago, and there's also former Commissioner Petrich, um, she knows that the port has kind of dabbled in workforce development a little bit, and I asked her, how do we cement this? And she said, create a resolution and throw some money at it. So two years ago, um, sponsored a resolution, the commission passed it with five, five nothing, and it was a five-year strategic plan designed to put one and a quarter million dollars over the five years into workforce development projects. And some of the strategic actions that we've been, um, we've contracted with Workforce Central to expand career pathways through paid work experiences and internships in the maritime and trades industries. And I think our latest contract, it it's, can be renewable up to three years, and it's um, approximately $175,000 for this year. They won the award, the grant for that, the contract. We also provide funding for Tacoma School District's Tide Flat Certification Program. We assisted with the purchase of training equipment for the Bethel School District and Clover Park Technical College um, because we have some uh, shipbuilders in the Tide Flats and Safe Boats International is one. They told us that they needed aluminum welders. So we bought 
Clover Park Te Technical College, a virtual uh, welding training lab for, for that purpose so that we can start feeding uh, those students directly into some maritime industry um, uh, jobs. And then we also take uh, regular tours uh, for high school students uh, to give them an up close look. I've attended career fairs at a lot of the different high schools around and especially grabbing people from uh, um, like a lot of women uh, trying to get young girls, hey, take a look at the map, you wanna work here. And also some other folks that feel that they didn't really get a fair shot or don't have access to the high paying jobs that in our tide flats. So um, that's been successful. Um, we've, like I said, we've just dabbled into it. We're not, uh, we don't wanna be service providers. There are great service pro providers. So we're going to put monies into those service providers, making sure that they reach out to, again, our diverse population, giving them access to these jobs. Um, I think that uh, you've probably, one major thing that happened was our uh, connection with Tacoma Public Schools and the Port of Tacoma. And we have, uh, we're now into our second phase of designing and building a new port admin building on the Wheeler Osgood um, facility and on the Foss Waterway. And, and right next to it is going to be a Maritime Trade Skills Center. And it's open to all South Sound uh, school districts from Federal Way all throughout Pierce County. It's to target the diverse population. It's uh, to target the building trades, construction trades, and maritime trades. So they're going to be our admin building and also this uh, new Maritime Trade Skills Center should be up and running. I think we're, do, we're hoping to get this up and running uh, in 2025, 20, 2026. So it's on a fairly fast track, but um, we're, we're excited about that. It's a great partnership. Um, we're also moving the facilities closer to the city, to the heart of the city, so that our uh, public has greater access to us. If you've ever been out to our admin building all the way out into the Tide Flats, it's hard to get access there. So now we're going to bring kids in. We're going to bring, um, you know, all of you in. We're hoping to have even a research center. Um, do we, I know that we've even talked about video production and all kinds of uh, great things to, to move this um, port administration into the next um, level, um, into the next century, I want to say. But uh, we're, we're very excited about it. So I think, Sam, that's all. I, I mean, I could talk all day. <laughs> I'm one of uh, That's great. <laughs> that's great. That, that, thanks, uh, Commissioner. Uh, uh, next up is Tom. Thank you, Sam. Uh, as you can tell, our Commissioner Keller is a very busy, busy person. If you just take a look at her resume, you notice mine is like half page. Hers is like, you need two pages. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I ask how many of you have had heard about Northwest Seaport Alliance? If you can raise your hand. Oh, a fair amount. Um, if you could just allow me to quickly tell you for those who first time hearing about Northwest Seaport Alliance. So um, I, we said, before I do that, I should acknowledge Commissioner, or former Commissioner uh, Claire Patridge, who were part of the commission at the time that had the foresight to say, you know what, Port of Seattle, Port of Tacoma, stop competing with each other. We need to um, join our efforts so we can focus on competing with ports outside of our region. And that's the birth of Northwest Seaport Alliance. That's back in 2015, were you here? No, not yet. Um, back in 2015, the two port commissioners came together and formed the Northwest Seaport Alliance. And the very purpose of that, the formation of the Seaport Alliance is so that we can compete together uh, with ports that Commissioner Keller mentioned north of us, Vancouver and Prince Rupert, and, and frankly, Southern California and elsewhere. Um, the other is that so that we can pour our resource together and, and make, her, make uh, good decisions for the region when it comes to infrastructure investments. So when I think of why the Seaport Alliance, I think of two Cs, um, competition and capital investment. And that give, also give us a greater opportunity to apply for grants. And we have really enjoyed some awesome grants from federal government and from state. Um, what Seaport Alliance is, is really is just a joint venture between the home port of Seattle and Tacoma. 
the commissioners from both Seattle and Tacoma um, said to us that c Lion staff, you are in charge of most, if not all, cargo facilities, Can both scenes. Yes. Oh, right. no, <laughs> Good. Just so uh, they can get it. Talk them into it, but talk it real close so we can all hear. So oh, thank you so much. Okay. Sorry. Should have should have had more walnuts before this. Um, and so 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 the Seaport Mines team really manages um, all the cargo facilities, both in Tacoma and as well as the, those in Seattle. So that's in a nutshell. We're also engaged with the supply chain, not just regionally, but internationally, like our, our Commissioner Keller mentioned. So with that understanding, let me move to my couple of slides. Um, I'm sure all of you are familiar with this, uh, this uh, slide. Um, this slide shows global hotspots where geopolitical Geopolitics and climate change are impacting global shipping. Like it or not, things happen. Uh, I will be willing to bet that the COVID experience is still painfully fresh in everyone's mind. Uh, what we all went through to get a roll of toilet paper uh, or food for the kitchen table. And the high prices when demand went through the roof as we all get on board with e-commerce. I, prior to COVID, I rarely purchased anything from online because I just, I'm cons I was con very conservative, didn't trust it. But you, guess what? I'm pretty good at shopping online. My husband will definitely attest to that. <laughs> um, we cannot always predict these types of events, but shippers, what I mean shippers, importers and exporters, must have risk mitigation strategies in place and be prepared to respond quickly when natural disasters or man-made events like this, uh, like these hot spots occur. Uh, consider this, uh, these uh, factors. Houthi is actively targeting commercial ocean shipping transit, transiting through the Suez Canal. And I think you can see from this uh, uh, slide I have. International shipping lines have rerouted cargo around the Cape of Good Hope, adding 10 days or more time to, to ocean shipment uh, from Asia. The additional distance means more fuel consumed, not good for the environment, and higher freight inventory cost, carrying costs from shippers using all water route. Um, of course, there's always upside. The upside is for carriers. Um, there is, has been um, some concern over um, uh, the amount of vessel coming online. There's overcapacity of vessels, um, but yet not enough demand. Well, guess what? This event really helped absorb some of this excessive vessel capacity. So that's an upside for the carriers. Um, the downside I mentioned, um, and just, for, just to put things in perspective, typical route would take about 12 vessels to transit from uh, using Suez Canal. And today, it takes 16 vessels because of that 10-day extra time because they have to go around and avoid the, the canal. Um, it's working out okay for our carriers for the moment. And how many of you remember how long we have been in the war uh, with, not we, Ukraine and, and Russia? How many? Do you recall any of you? Two years. I was shocked. I thought it's just like it's been going on for just what twelve months. Two years we have been in that. Oh, not we. That that war has been going on. Um, the war in Ukraine has restricted shipping lines, um, shipping lanes, and reduced the global supply of grains and raw materials like aluminum and potash and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, which translate into higher prices for these key commodities and finished goods for U.S. consumers. We're all paying for it. Possibly the greatest risk to global supply chain at the moment, I think it's, it all has to do with geopolitics, that geopolitical tensions, not you know the South China Sea. The Asian Pacific region accounts for nearly 50% of worldwide manufacturing output, and China accounts for about a little bit short of 30%. As much um, of the trade flows through the South China Sea, the conflict, the conflict between China and Southeast Asia countries over claim to these waters create a high degree of uncertainty 
of global supply chains, not to mention the strained relationship between China and Taiwan. It all makes um, for an elevated risk environment. And finally, speaking of uh, hot spots, um, can't forget about the Panama Canal. <laughs> the Panama Canal has experienced drought conditions for months, limiting the number of ships through all types, uh, all, of all types through the canal. I was there last October and, and, and saw that with my own eye. Um, and not to mention the cost. I was shocked to hear about the cost. A typical ship transiting the canal typically pay half a million dollars. Guess what they pay today? They pay that half a million dollars. On top of that, they pay a reservation fee of the equal amount. That's a million dollars. It's 800 to a million dollars. Think about that impact on the cost of supply chain. And um, the, if, uh, sorry, I lost my, my own thought here. And, and the other thing I wanted to point out, this is probably not as a well-known fact. Um, do you know how much water is required for one vessel to transit through Panama Canal? 50 million gallons of water. 50 million, these are drinking waters. So, you know, sometimes I, I wonder, um, is this really a sustain, sustainable solution uh, for the sh global shipping? I know it's desired at the moment, but is it really uh, good for the environment? Um, personally, given where I am, representing the Seaport Alliance, I want the drought to keep going. I want the Panama Canal to be shut down, but that, that is beyond, <laughs> beyond the point. Um, but I, I, as you hear about Panama Canal, keep that in mind, because I think those are important uh, facts that's, uh, that's uh, not well reported. Um, geo geopolitical uh, tension is only one of a number of potential supply chain disruptors that can impact supply chain. As I mentioned, I think there's a heightened, certainly for me, I'm, I'm very aware of the geopolitics around the world and what that creates the uncertainty it creates for the supply chain. If I can go to the next slide, please. Thank you very much. This is what I would call a honeycomb of supply chain disruptors. Any of this could upset the global supply chains. Um, aside from geopolitical uh, tensions, shippers must respond to changes um, ocean carriers are making to their business models, which have triggered a restructuring or uh, of shipping alliances and shipping routes. You might have heard the two EMs are Maersk and MSC, the two of the largest carriers in the world. They were married for a while, and guess what? They're breaking up starting in 2025. And even though this is the last year, we have already seen they're, they're behaving differently. They're restructuring their service routes. They're, um, they're acquiring other, um, they're doing a lot of vertical integration, getting ready for uh, the, breakage, uh, the breakage of the marriage in 2025. Um, it is, these changes are constant. Importers and exporters will need to reevaluate their carriers and their service networks based on these new relationships. And I know Rick our will, will share with you more on, on that aspect of it. And it really doesn't help all of us, the sourcing paths not helping this gateway. So, I should mention this, a lot of the, my comments have filtered through my, what I represent, which is the Seaport Alliance. So um, they're a bit of a bias there. Sourcing patterns can change over time in response to risk factors you see here. For example, for example shippers walk up to the fact that U.S.-China US tensions and sourcing problems during COVID post posed a real threat to the supply chain. So we have seen migration from away from China. It used to be China plus, China plus one. I really don't think that's accurate. It's China plus, period. It's China plus Vietnam, plus India, plus Thailand, plus many other uh, uh, potential countries. Mexico is another one. So we have seen that migration away from China, and it's definitely showing up in our trade stats. Um, although I have to say that China remains to be number one for this gateway, and our sweet spot really is to trade with China, Northeast Asian countries. Once you go beyond Singapore, then the shippers have a choice. They don't have to go through 
they don't have to come to Seattle, Tacoma. They can go to uh, East Coast. They can go through the canals and uh, uh, taking different routes. Um, Commissioner Keller and I were just attending uh, what we call Trans-Pacific Maritime Conference, TPM, just a uh, um, uh, couple weeks ago, right? Um, there, there um, a number of um, industry uh, forecasting uh, research firms shared that um, the outlook for the global trade is improving, but it is very fragile. Um, as you can see here from all these uh, cells of, of potential disruptors to the supply chain. Um, in fact, one of them cited um, this year, um, we're dealing with more elevated risks than we have had in the last 25 years. Um, shippers really do need to be prepared for natural disasters or man-made disasters. Um, in my opinion, the most significant risk of all um, is, our, is our own election. <laughs> Um, you might have heard our um, um, uh, uh, Trump um, has threatened um, in many occasions that um, if he's elected, he could shut down our trade with China, not shut down by imposing 100% tariff or 60% tariff. And that is not good for this gateway. It, it, will be a, it will have a devastating impact for this gateway. Um, so I will stop there. Thank you. Nice, Tong, for the uh, both informative and occasionally uh, worrisome information. Um, so next, uh, we're going to turn it over to uh, Rick Baltimore, who works in the, with Providence, and said earlier, Rick, looking forward to your comments. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming. This is this is really important to me today for a couple things. One, I'm a UW alumni from this campus. And I always uh, take the opportunity to give back. I also, uh, like many of you that came with your time, is uh, super passionate about supply chain, the profession of supply chain, bringing the science, I gotta get closer here, the science and the data and the people together as a profession. It's an area that we need to continue to focus on and developing future leaders. So um, to hear that this, this school is committed to a supply chain program, is outstanding for our community. Uh, also, just a student of learning about supply chain, I've already learned a ton in the last half hour, so I'm sure you guys have too, so it's really great. I have been on the shipper side, I've been on the manufacturing side, I've been on the carrier side, and then uh, last nine years on the healthcare side. So let's take a look at the next slide, uh, talk about healthcare. Why healthcare? Why, you don't, you don't think of it this way, but you think about the big, big, um, Corporations in Seattle, you think of Boeing and Microsoft and Starbucks. But if you look at this list here, we're the sixth largest employer in the region. Now we're in seven states, but uh, we're a big company, $27 billion company. Uh, we're number one nonprofit in the nation in healthcare. We're a top 20 health system. And my team moves about $2 billion in medical supplies, which is pretty phenomenal when you think about the size and scale of that. Uh, so don't sleep on healthcare. Healthcare uh, has about 22 million work, workers, making up about 14% of the workforce. Now, depends how you slice it. It's as low as 11 or as high as 22, because you think about it, as a person at Rite Aid, part of healthcare, they actually are, right? As that chiropractor, the dentist, you really start putting it all together. Man, one out of five people in this country is in the healthcare supply chain, healthcare service, some way. It's pretty phenomenal. Uh, healthcare is the largest uh, expense in our actual government expenditures, almost 18%. And um, yeah, so that, that's, that's Providence. We're, we're a, a wonderful company, a nonprofit here locally. The next slide will show you what does it look like? Well, it's all in little tiny bins. That $2 billion was touched one item at a time, size of this pen, size of a, a gown, a surgical item, implantable item. So you think about it, we have, uh, we, we, our team moves about over 200,000 requisition lines a week. That's, that's a pretty large volume that has to work uh, flawlessly. You, healthcare has zero room for error, kind of like airplanes, other things. 
the, if you miss, if you miss, make a mistake, it's going to impact somebody, right? It's going to impact somebody's life. And we take that uh, to work with us every day. We have about 600,000 inventory locations. So when I show these bins on the screen, uh, each one of those is inventory location. Each one of those has an inventory locator. Each one is managed with a level, an inventory. Um, we hover over every single bin in the system, so take that time, 600,000. And inside those bins, there's about uh, 100,000 different items in those bins, and in our item master, we have over 500,000 active items. So again, back to that science and data and the professional supply chain, it takes an expertise. Uh, we have a great team of experts uh, to manage these supplies. You think about our vendors, we have over 30,000 vendors supporting us and uh, over 10,000 daily parcel shipments. Think of a, a, U, a UPS or a FedEx. Uh, so there's a lot going on there. I'm gonna jump to the next slide. We talked about this a little bit already, that's my colleagues. But think about the butterfly effect uh, in supply chain. You know, we had, we had that container, we talked about it. You know, these ships have 100,000 horsepower and they're, they're going at a slow speed through the canals. This one tended to get off a little bit, and how do you straighten out a, a container ship when it slows down, right? The way to do it is speed up, ironically, right? So you're, now you're speeding up this ship, and as you get closer to one side, the different speeds of the water is pulling you closer, so you speed up and just augured, augured it right into the other side of the canal. Well, what was it, six days? $50 billion of uh, product was stuck. And, that shows up in our hospitals, right? It shows up, shows up all across the U.S. So these things really do make a um, global impact. Uh, the next one that I, you can see there is Long Beach. So, you know, there's only about 15, 20 container ships in the ports um, out in the, in the sea waiting to bring in. And uh, at the peak of this, there was over 100 ships. I think it was 109 was the peak. And you guys are really familiar with that. Um, but I was familiar with it because we were reaching out to the ports, making contact, saying, hey, on one of those vessels is this item I need for surgeries coming up. This is a true story. And we, we made contacts. We were, we we're carefully trying to track those items. It's like, okay, that'll be brought in, we think, in, say, 10 days. Great. Well, guess what happened as soon as the, the vessel got to, the, to be unloaded? There was a shortage of dredge divers, drivers. There was a shortage of warehouse space. And then finally you get it to a, a, a consolidation center or a warehouse to be transloaded up to come up to the Northwest or another state. Oh, now there's a shortage of full truckload carriers. And so the supply chain impact of something as simple as a backlog at the port, it started having an impact on our patient care. It was, it was really a difficult time for us as well. And as on top of the COVID experience, it was on top of uh, the manufacturers across the U.S. and around the world were short in labor. We were just talking today about, you know, the price of daycare going up, less people in the workforce, then you throw in COVID and inflation, and all of a sudden um, our standard manufacturers were just saying, sorry, we can't meet your fill rate. You know, you need a 99% fill rate to have 100% of the bin, and suddenly they're filling us at 75%. So we lived through that. Um, and then now we have the, the Red Sea crisis with the Houthis, uh, and we're living through that. It does add, it's, you know, it's adding more time and more cost uh, there's, not, there's no room we're a nonprofit. We actually lost money last, since COVID. We've lost money every year, and now we're, all, our, all our manufacturers are saying, hey, we need more, all our distributors, we need more uh, to cover inflation. And uh, healthcare is unable to just go out and charge more, right? You can't just go to Medicare and say, hey, I need more tomorrow. They, they know this is what you get paid, and we have to absorb those costs. So it's, it's a really challenging thing, and supply chain is a big driver in uh, our cost structure. And the last one on my list here is cyber attacks. We were hacked. Um, along with many healthcare systems just a few weeks ago. Uh, it impacted one of our vendors that does the transactions where prescriptions are digitally written to doctors and to, from doctors to uh, your local provider. Well, guess what? We couldn't, do, uh, we couldn't issue a prescription, so we had to do a paper one, which, is, which was exciting because we launched our emergency response team in the supply chain, and we, we, within an hour, we had a team together, and we were reached out to the... Um, the printers that printed the paper, paper prescription, right? It's all supply chain, right? So you have to print these hard copies and they're highly regulated and they're um, highly secured and chain of command, but we got, got to our printer and we got these items secured and brought them in and, and uh, I don't wanna say save the day, but we were able to keep our operations going. Um, and then yesterday, obviously that truck, uh, the, the vessel hit the bridge in Baltimore and um, 
really hor horrible, horrible situation. But that's like with the ninth largest container port in the U.S. It's going to be down for a while. I mean, they're not even, they're, they're still trying to recover um, the bodies, unfortunately, and it's not even time to talk about the next steps. Um, but that'll impact us, right? That'll, we didn't, I started calling our vendors by six o'clock in the morning and our distributors, and they're saying, no, we're okay. We don't have any products tied up. But it'll have a ripple effect. All this, all this has a significant ripple effect. So let me, um, let me just talk a little bit about COVID, and then, then we can go on to the next. Uh, COVID did change. You know, we started by saying global events reshape strategy. Absolutely. And COVID was the start of much of this. We've gone through significant efforts to deglobalize ourselves. You know, when, if you've been in supply chain long enough, you lived through the era where every, we shifted from local manufacturing to, to NAFTA and, and, and China, of course, and that kind of happened right un, under, our, under us. We, just, we all lived through it, and that became the norm. Well, now we're very strategically with our partners. How do we deglobalize? How do we move away from China? You mentioned it. It's, it's real. We're, we're having those conversations, and we're taking it a step further. In our contracts, you have to have, uh, we're, we're putting in our contracts that you gotta have spare capacity. Because we found during COVID, when things got tight, um, there, was no, there was no extra capacity in the manufacturing upstream. And so we said, okay, now you gotta have spare capacity. Oh, dual sourcing. We had, we had vendors that uh, are suppliers that would say, we want one manufacturer because we want a certain resin. It's highly controlled. You don't want your um, syringes coming with different different quality, right? We want to very much control this resin from this supplier upstream three or four levels. And uh, that worked for years and years. Now we're saying, no, no, we're, we're asking in our contract, say you need to have dual source. You know, th those manufacturers might have, we might have 50 manufacturers, they might have a thousand beneath that of their providers. And we're saying, no, you got to look deeper into your vertical supply chain and build that resiliency in. And we're being really intentional about that. We're building uh, risk sensing models, and this is where uh, we're getting the AI a little bit later here as we have time, but we're using data and, and new way of thinking. How do we look around the world and sense these risks immediately and so we can react quick enough? Because if you don't react quick, you're going to be in a real mess. And I'll just talk about COVID for one second, and then we can move on. When COVID hit, hit uh, was it February 19th of 2020 with the first patient, it was our Everett site. First patient in the U.S., if you remember that. And luckily, at the end of 2019, we, we, were, we were pretty ignorant about it in the U.S. We, were, we was on the news. We were all like, eh, yeah, we're, we're going to be fine. But I remember thinking the, Chin the, the Chinese New Year's, I think in January, but the Chinese New Year's extended twice and maybe even more. And when, when the Chinese New Year's extended, we were, we, were, we were doing the math on a whiteboard at our office in Rennes, and we said, okay. Uh, if they're shutting down manufacturing, we're going to run out of supplies. And we said April. We, we actually mapped it out, put the port time, lead time, the distribution time. Okay, what's it we had in stock? We said April. And the next day, we started, we started placing POs for large-scale POs for PPE, which is, which is your gowns and your bouffants and shoe covers and things that shields and masks, the gloves that really protected our doctors and nurses. We had to go sit in front of the CFO and say, we would need this massive check, the biggest check ever uh, for PPE to a vendor we've never met before who doesn't, the language is language barrier, is a time zone barrier. We don't know this vendor, but if we don't, if we don't write this check right now, we're, we're going to get beat by somebody else. We're not going to have supplies for our doctors. And we took a chance. We did it. And we had many middle of the night calls trying to figure out how to get it in the country, which port, who was going to drain it. And because we don't have that expertise, we, usually our distributors just bring it in. And, uh, Turns out it was the best thing ever. So come April, it was when you started watching the news and doctors and other, other communities were running, wearing trash bags yeah. to, to stay protected. Remember that? Our, our, luckily, we had the PPE in stock. And we brought it in. And we ended up spending um, close to $200 million on PPE after that. So that little check that was so big was just tiny in the grand scheme of things. Um, but that really changed. It really changed us. It changed Providence. It changed healthcare across the country. Um, I could, I could talk for an hour on it, but there's, there's a lot of data to change us um, and how we think about resiliency and uh, deep globalization and looking at data. Okay, I think I'll stop there. Thanks, Rick. Uh, and finally, uh, Luna, look forward to your comments. 
Yeah, well, thank you. First of all, I would really love to pause and show our appreciation for the healthcare providers never run out of PPE. And, you know, if you're looking at the things that you have, the shoes that you're wearing, the jackets you are wearing, right? And even the notebook I just noticed was made from China. And then how would that happen end up in our hands? It's because of the ports. So I really want to show some really appreciation that these wonderful people are doing so that our supply chain can work. And as consumers, we can get the things we want, right? So um, in the past 30 minutes, I've learned a lot then, um, from the supplier side, but uh, I'm pretty sure everybody was and is still a consumer at some point. So I would like to talk about supply chain in our consumer perspective view. So first of all, you can see the toilet paper shortage, not even only toilet paper, but a lot of other things, right? So during pandemic, people are locked into their own homes. So they really got panic about whether they can get their grocery on time, even toilet paper on time. And back in that time, before COVID, a lot of industry is really like depending on the lean sort of production method. So lean means that they really want to keep the inventory low so that they can reduce the cost. Right. However, when this type of disruption came, nobody was prepared, and all of a sudden, demand is shoot up because consumers were panic, and all of a sudden they went into um, the grocery stores to buy toilet paper. To be honest, like, do they really use more toilet papers like per day during pandemic be than before pandemic? No, of course, it's just because of the panic. Right. So because of that, a lot of things have changed. During the pandemic, a lot of retail stores have implemented some, you know, senior hours and to uh, have designated hours for people who are really in need for those grocery shoppies. And not only that, like Tom just mentioned, that we are forced to purchase online. And before that, Amazon was booming, but not in that scale. But all of a sudden, everybody was locked down into their own home. So that's why you see a lot of delivery complaints came out. So for instance, Instacart, as you can see in this um, slide. So do you know that Instacart was founded 2012? But did you know that before pandemic? I had no idea. But starting in pandemic, I use Instacart every day because I feel that is the safest way for me to purchase anything, right? Not only, you know, good retail shopping, grocery shopping, but also if you think about your everyday life and um, talking about healthcare, before the pandemic, people are so used to the traditional healthcare, go to visit the doctor uh, in their office, but then during pandemic, it just couldn't. So that's why telehealth became a, such a large thing during the pandemic. And um, even Costco has recently collaborated with Sesame, one of the largest online healthcare provider, to provide some online healthcare. I'm pretty sure there will be some disruption to the traditional healthcare system as well. And uh, um, people, even for the Medicare demand, um, you know, in the telehealth, which is online healthcare, um, showed up in 10, 100, no, tenfold during the pandemic. And now when the consumers, patients, they are so used to this type of the online shopping, online healthcare, they are going to keep this habit, right? In supply chain management, we talk about matching supply with demand because our ultimate goal is, serve, is to serve the consumers. So I know that a lot of students are sitting here, so I just want to um, take one step back and talk about what is really a supply chain. So supply chain is actually not just one chain, it's a network. So for instance, if we look at this notebook, right, this notebook has a lot of uh, different ingredients going into this notebook. There are paper, and this must be some different material, and dyeing the color of this cover, right, they may come from different suppliers. So a manufacturer will source from different suppliers and to manufacture different products. And then guess what? They don't directly sell to the consumers. And how can those products can end up in the consumer's hands? We have to have wonderful logistics complaints like distributors. So they use ships, they use 
whatever you know, transportation modes like railways, trucks, to send that to a wholesale warehouse. And then the wholesale warehouse would distribute to the local retail stores. And also if you purchase from Amazon or Shein or Taimu, then you just click online and they will ship uh, wherever their uh, inventory is. Right. So when consumer keep this online shopping habit, then the supply chain or the supply network need to really think about how we can cater to the shifted consumer demand, even after the pandemic. Right. So there was there is a lot of um, competition there too. You see the competition between online or fly. You see even in the healthcare domain, you have the competition like telehealth and also traditional one. And also, um, to my surprise, and maybe to your surprise, then even in our educational system, we see competitions from the online platforms. So how many of you have no Coursera? Most students must have known that. So Cursoria is an online educational platform uh, which collaborate with a lot of renowned universities to deliver some program which charges much lower fee than traditional educational system. Right? So not only that, even within the re uh, traditional educational system, then the students demand flexibility then as faculty and staff, we have to deliver this flexibility to the student as well. So that's why you see UW spend our tons of money to have premium subscription with Zoom and Panapto, so then the instructors can have seamless um, you know, experience to create the videos for the students to learn and also to have an online learning experience. If we may go to the next slide, so um, to, talking about the competition, and you might be surprised that um, you know, a lot of students really care about, oh, what they will do after graduation. And I sort of have this curiosity to you. So I searched supply chain job in the greater Seattle area. Guess what? These are the top five um, positions that popped up. As you can see, Boeing provides supply chain uh, management position, which is not a question, right? You know, they are traditional manufacturers, um, and it's very common. And we also have Amazon. Of course, Amazon has a big marketplace. They own their logistics teams, and they need to deliver things. But guess what? Out of five positions, three are from TikTok. And can you believe TikTok is such a traditional, like, social media platform? You would, for an average person, no one will ever link TikTok with supply chain. But why is that? Because of the vertical integration. So you guys know influencers, and probably some of you are doing some ticket dance and to get some influence and monetize that, right? One way to monetize your social media contents is to provide a link to let your audience to purchase something. So before TikTok launched the supply chain program, uh, last September, it's very recent, it's only last September, you know, the influencer can direct those uh, audience to, for instance, Amazon or Nike or Adidas website. Now, the TikTok does not earn any money. If the, if the traffic was diverted, uh, directed to the third party, well, to TikTok um, retail stores. But if TikTok can vertically integrate those, and TikTok can directly sell the products to the consumers, then TikTok can also get some share from the pie, right? So that is why, you know, even we have some controversy about TikTok recently, but TikTok and a lot of um, traditional social media platform, they are doing supply chain related work. So the supply chain is everywhere. If you look at the clothes you're wearing, the shoes you're wearing, and if you think about, oh, I'm, I'm scrolling down the TikTok for five, like two hours per day. They are all supply chain. So that is one competition. Another one is that um, I really want to talk about our education system is that we also see a lot of competition too, in the sense that um, the education system is sort of supply, like a supply chain too. So the students are our supplies. 
right? And we manufacture, quote unquote, manufacture the, the students and then send them out as graduates and to find uh, a, a role. And to our surprise is that the enrollment, especially for MBA program, is going down year after year. So the second um, picture shows you that the enrollment of the MBA program, um, the change, the percentage change over there. So why does that happen? So that is actually a supply chain issue. So there is competition is that, you know, when you as an undergraduate graduate, if you can find a job, why would you like to nurse an MBA? Another thing is that, um, because we also have some political reasons and visa restrictions. Traditionally, we have a lot of MBA students, not, not um, only in our Tacoma, but nationwide. A lot of MBA applicants are international students. But now the international students have really some barrier to enter the, this, this country, especially during pandemic. So that's why the enrollment went down quite a bit. And then, of course, MBAs, um, you know, the industry really requires a different skill set than the traditional MBA, where most likely we focus on qualitative skills to how to manage the organization, how to manage the company. But nowadays, people are talking about big data, data analytics, and AI. And, you know, as educa uh, education systems and we are the manufacturers. We really need to change our program to suit this demand. This is how the educational system can, you know, match our supply with the, with the demand of the industry so that we can equip the students with the suitable skills so that the students can find um, the jobs when they go into the job market. So that's all I want to talk about. Thank you, Sam. Thanks, Leonard. Thanks, all of you, for some great uh, information. Very, very interesting. I'm only going to ask one question, then turn it over to the uh, to the audience to ask questions. We have time for to do that. Uh, and so, when I ask my question, don't don't uh, go too long in answering it. Uh, and it's for for all of you. But let's pretend it's five years from now. It's 2029, and we're holding this um, panel discussion again in five years from now. What we'd like to see have had happened over the last five years to make our supply chains and our ports be more successful. It could be a policy, a technology, or a change in regional, national, or global realities. Um, so yeah, what, 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 what uh, five years from now we hope will have changed uh, to make us more successful, whether as a port or a supply chain, and make your lives easier as a company? Uh, would be uh, Sam, if I could go first, because I will be retired in five years. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, I would think um, in there are a couple of things that I think we should do to ensure success. We need to continue um, through our commissioners uh, advocate for a, um, a fair but reasonable trade policy. Um, I really feel the globalization has taken uh, a beating uh, in the last few years. Um, and port depends on trade. So if everything is manufactured in the U.S., we'll be out on business, Rick. So please don't bring everything back. <laughs> um, so that is, I think it's vital to the survival of all ports, not just Seaport Alliance. Um, the other is that I think we need to continue to, to stay flexible and adapt to the changing consumer behavior, such as the growth of e-commerce. That has triggered a number of changes in the supply chain. For instance, we have seen such a outburst and growth of transload business in our gateway. So that is an area of focus for us, uh, Sam. Um, and, and I might have mentioned about I think both Rick and uh, all of you have mentioned about supply chain visibility. That is um, absolutely one area of focus for us. We all have gone through that painful period of time when my phone was <laughs> going crazy during the COVID time because everybody's calling looking for their containers. Containers got buried and I, 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 I shouldn't keep 
I really want to tell you a story, but I won't because Sam, you said keep it short, so I'll stop there. And those are some of my um, observations and thoughts. Well, I would also agree with Tom. We need to have better, well, we do have trade policies and agreements, but we just don't use them. And it's according to political whim, as, as she had mentioned, and it's uh, punishing one government for political activities that really hurt the consumers of both countries. And um, it's just uh, incredibly not very thoughtful. Um, I was <clears throat> at a Confucius Institute um, discussion about decoupling trade with China, and we can't. We are, we can't go back. We are all, it's, it would be incredibly um, horrifying for both China consumers and also the United States as well. So we need to find a better way of doing this and remove the politics from, from this. Let's let political leaders and the diplomats work that out. But you know, in terms of our supply chain, it's too crucial for all of us. We are so globalized that you know, we can't go back anymore, so. Okay, so yeah, I totally agree. And even you think about, uh, even if you think about the supply chain, they're interconnected. Everybody's con connected. Suppliers, you know, um, the downstream consumers too, and even in the educational system as well. And we do want to have some stable policies so that we can work on more students into the classroom. So that when the industrials uh, are in need to uh, to hire the, the people, they can find some people to hire. To be honest when the trade war happens. Uh, the, the thing is that it's hard to find some talents that really can suit the job. Is it because then, you know, people don't want to know? We don't have too many people who are having this skill set, right? We need to have a continuous supply of the student so that we can equip the student with the uh, qualified uh, skill set to send them to the labor market so then everybody can, can boom because of the, uh, you know, stable policy. All right. Well, the question was, what does success look like in five years, if I understood it right? You know, we're at a real inflection point in supply chains with uh, data, cloud, AI. Those are all commingled. You can't have one without the other, right? AI only works if you have massive amounts of data. We're talking about millions and billions of records for it to really work properly. And so everything's changing. Every Every day, is, it's a transition from normal supply chain activities to how do we use AI. And you know, I, I don't have time to get into all of it, but I can tell you every aspect of our work from the sourcing to the contracting to the procurement to the um, communication back to our requisitioners to the way we look at items and order them to the inventory, we're, we're introducing AI to that, right? So what does success look like? Well, it's kind of scary, right? I think it's, it's probably scary, scary to students. It's, it's, uh, it's a lot of unknown. To me, success looks like uh, people still matter. We do it in a way where AI is walking alongside our people. AI makes us better. AI is one plus one equals five and not one plus one is two or 1.5. And the people, the people that drive supply chains and industries are the most important thing. And we can't lose sight of that. And I think the companies that will thrive in this inflection point are the ones that recognize that and really lean into their people through the change and transition. Because it is hard. It's going to be hard. It's going to be a massive change for everybody here and everybody in this room, the way it's evolving so quickly. Thanks, all of you. Uh, uh, Dean Merchant, there is somebody there in the room. Hopefully, can call on people in the room since I can't uh, do that. Uh, I feel a little bit like a disembodied AI doing this uh, remotely. Mark Wayside. Hello, I'm Stan Emmert, and I yeah, from the Milgard School, and I just can't help myself because you guys, what a tremendous job you did in this. Thank you so much for for coming and talking about a huge issue. So while I've I've got a hundred questions, I'll just ask one, and the one relates to this. Um, most farm equipment, uh, farm and agricultural equipment in the United States comes through the Port of Baltimore. Port of Baltimore is shut down at least until May. Can the Port of Tacoma outcompete everybody else and get that business? 
Absolutely. I'm sending somebody on, on a plane to go to Baltimore so, so we can bring those. So I, I should uh, joke aside, I should mention that the Seaport Alliance is not just about container. We have, um, under the leadership of our commissioners, we have a very diversified cargo portfolio. So we do handle uh, the type of cargo you describe, we call them brick bulk cargo. So we do handle container, brick bulk, and bulk, and um, automobile as well. So yes, we, we're watching this and we will be contacting some of the, what we call BCOs, the cargo owners. Absolutely, but thank you. Hi, my name is Karina Martia Harris. Um, thank you so much all for your insights. I really do appreciate them. Um, I have a background in maritime as well, and I'm currently the program manager for the Tacoma Maritime Innovation Incubator. Um, I really, really appreciated the insights on the problems that you all were facing since every year throughout Maritime Blue, where we have cohorts of startups that actively look to pursue problems. I was just curious to know um, if there were potential avenues for startups and or small businesses to get involved with all of you, um, especially since, as an example, I know terminal congestion is a common complaint. Um, so that way we know at Maritime Blue as well as other partners what startups that we should potentially be looking to recruit for next classes as well as look at our current database of startups to see who could potentially help um, propose a solution to some of the problems that you all are currently facing. So thank you. I know that <clears throat> she's doing a great job with her program with her Maritime Blue and, and the startups. In fact, I see some, some of her um, founding uh, owners here as well. Um, when Sam and I were in Europe, uh, we went to the port of Rotterdam, and not only do they have a workforce development section, but they also have a startup section, and they help support that. We're currently taking a look at how we can also do that. That would be another way to develop community wealth building, you know, with especially with the small businesses that are trying to get started in the maritime industry. And these people are doing a lot of really great innovative work. So. Um, moving our admin center closer we're going to be right down the street from you now so uh, we're hoping to do a lot more with that as well so we'll be in close touch with you to develop that if i may can i add something i think we are launching maybe associating and Chao Chao can talk, talk about that we are launching our entrepreneurship program so then you know we are so close to to you guys and then if you want to learn some you know, um, academically uh, skill sets, uh, entrepreneurship, we are able to provide that skill sets. Hello, I am Jackie Raj, and I am recently been admitted in the master's program here in the spring section. So uh, thank you so much for the very nice presentation and uh, the understanding you gave us today on the global challenges and opportunities uh, related to supply chain. My question is that uh, since Ms. Uh, uh, Tongzhu also mentioned that thing as well, that one vessel and 50 million gallons and all these things. Uh, what are your challenges related to sustainability? What, since the world is focusing right now on the sustainability issues, so what challenges and what are the, you know, uh, solutions you have for related to sustainability? Thank you. I think some of the challenges that we have are we talked about governmental policies and you know some of them have been designed to supposedly help you know like this HMT um, it doesn't help us here and they forget about that so we're having to go back to our federal government our legislators and say I understand why you're doing what you're doing but at least give us back some of that money so that we can use it so we're constantly the government is trying to do the right thing for us but then um, other things get in the way a little bit and we have to you know go back and do a little bit of re-educating and also stressing um the the issues that we have i think some other issues that i noticed europe compared to the united states is that we have 50 unique states that have their own laws their own structures their own governments and it becomes very difficult to have an equal playing field with the ports in our country 
I mean, it's very difficult. We have like the Port of Savannah. They can get things while well, we were in Long Beach and they are creating in um, 400 acres of land outside into the Pacific Ocean. We couldn't do that here at the Port of Tacoma and can't do it in Seattle as well, but they're doing it for offshore wind and they're going to be, it's a several billion dollar project, but they're getting federal grants for that. They're, it's just not an equal playing field for us. And it, it, that, there's that constant issue with regard to that, wouldn't you say, mm -hmm. Tom? Um, maybe just a couple um, addition to what Commissioner shared. Um, Washington State is very progressive in terms of the environmental practice. Um, very much so. The, the state is known as evergreen state, and naturally, um, so our commissioners and have uh, really had a number of initiatives that help drive um, to stay sustainable through, you know, through the, the terms of all of our leases with with various terminals and cargo owners, and so we have green initiative that that just focus on air quality water quality and other uh, other sustainable practice. We also, uh, just to uh, give you an example, we um, received some grant money and we used that to help the trucking company to swap out their old trucks so that they can have newer trucks that, um, that help manage emission, um, so kind of an emission control. We have very specific target, you know, in 2030 or 2030? 2030. 2030, we have zero footprints. That's pretty aggressive, 2030. 2040, I'm sorry. 40. <laughs> That's close to my retirement. But 2040, <laughs> we'll have uh, zero footprint, and that's pretty aggressive. So we are, um, our commissioners have directed us, and through uh, some funding from state and federal, we're uh, building shore power plugging. What does that mean? It means the vessel coming in, so burning their, uh, the marine fuel, they'll plug, in, like, plug into our electricity. Those cleaner power, cleaner uh, way of fueling the, um, keeping the, the vessel running. So those come at a huge cost. You know, we, we, we just finished that Terminal 5 in Seattle, $30 million just to have that done. So it's, it's real money and it's real commitments. And we're doing that in all aspects of our business. But thank you for that good question. Yeah. Just, I want to add one thing to the question because there's two sides to it. Providence is um, one of their top priorities is environmental sustainability. They're, they're really aggressive about it. We actually, our team won a CFO award today because we grew um, through our sourcing. We've had a, a five-fold increase in number of suppliers that meet our green initiatives. Really proud of that work. And then the flip side, medical supplies, pretty much every surgery requires a, a device that's clean with um, ethylene oxide. I don't know if you guys have heard about this. And the EPA says we're going to reduce it by 80%. So I, I'm in. But there's no, there's no uh, alternative. So it's left, it's left the industry in a lurch. Now, luckily, the EPA came out last week and said, hey, we're going to slow this down a little bit. Thank goodness, because we were all going, how are we going to have medical devices cleaned and um, our medical supplies that require the ethanol oxide uh, process. So it's, it's, and nobody wants to increase costs on any of this stuff, right? It, I mean, yeah. there's zero room for cost increases and yet you need more regulation and more environmental stability. It's, it's, a, it's a dance. Good question. Hello, uh, Michael Fowler with the World Trade Center Tacoma which is sponsored by the Port of Tacoma and works closely with the Northwest Seaboard Alliance. I have a comment and a, and a question. A comment is that um, I'm so glad to hear about these entrepreneurial programs and the incubators coming up because Tacoma is becoming a hotbed of startups and trade. Uh, and, and, and trade because these days with, a, with a, a simple cell phone, you can trade and with AI is going to make it easier. So we're moving more and more in that direction. Um, having said that, I, I, I wanted to ask a question about supply chain. How, how far is, is, is the issues that are at the Panama Canal, uh, are they causing our reach west uh, to go beyond Singapore? Do you foresee, for example, east coast of India becoming uh, more important uh, for incoming traffic to our ports? 
Uh, I should say that um, Panama Canal it really serves East Coast, those vessels coming, you know, the transiting through canal and go to East Coast ports. So, um, and, and then uh, Seattle Tacoma port or Seaport Line is really, we call ourselves a discretionary port because we have a small population, about 8 million people compared to Southern California, 40 million people. So um, our port, the growth of our port is dependent on discretionary cargo. That means cargo comes through our port but don't stay here and then they move inland to Chicago or beyond. So, um, so is Panama relevant? There's some relevance, but it's not the main. main I see. Uh, so yeah, it's, main. it's not pushing traffic to the West Coast because it more, becomes more expensive and slow to get to the East Coast. Uh, but it, there's a possibility. There's a possibility because all these cargo can come through our gateway and get on rail, you know, through, uh, uh, provided BNSF or UP, and, and then interchange in Chicago and reach all the East Coast uh, population. So th it is alternative. Um, but, but it's not major. It's not major. Yeah, it's not major. Okay. Thank you. Sam, Sam, I don't think we see any more questions from the audience. Oh, there's one. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, Steve Keller, I'm retired, happen to be married to Deanna, which is wonderful. Um, for those of you who don't know, I believe in our state we have over 70 ports. Is that correct? Over 70. My question, and also, Tong, well said about the diver diversification of our port. We're a strategic uh, port for the base, JBLM. Yes. We're recognized across the country as one of the best ports to transport their vehicles and their equipment, which is awesome. My question is this, is the unfair taxing on our cans, our TEUs, 100 bucks a piece, these ships are carrying 12 to 18,000 cans. That's a million plus dollars per ship just to come to our port. Question is, and I'm sure the 70 ports in, in the state don't pay that same tax, do the other deep water ports also pay the tax? Does Seattle pay the tax? Does Long Beach pay the tax? And where does the money really go? If we can get rid of that and not pay for it since we get no money back, you take a million bucks off each ship coming there, we're going to improve our, our shipping. So get rid of that tax. <laughs> Number one, uh, I, I, I should say this, Steve, would you step in when she's not um, She's taking a long vacation. Can you just step in as a commissioner? Because you know more, <laughs> you know a lot more than, than any average person. And I, you're right. I forgot to miss. I, I missed to mention um, military cargo is very important. It's part of our cargo portfolio. So thank you, Steve, for pointing that out. Now the harbor maintenance tax uh, is imposed on um, cargo that <coughs> which any of the seaport in the US. So it doesn't matter if it's Seattle, Tacoma, or LA and Long Beach. If you use a seaport, if this cargo comes through, foreign cargo comes through any of the seaport in, in, in the US, they pay that point, blah, 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 zero, zero percent based on the value of the cargo. It is unfair in the sense, um, so, so uh, Commissioner Calder mentioned if the cargo, U.S. bound cargo, if they chose to go through, say, Vancouver, B.C., they don't have to pay that. And they, because, you know what, they, it, it, uh, this cargo um, offload in Vancouver, get on the rail, it's land, it's not seaport, you know, it's not reaching the seaport, about U.S. seaport. They transit that directly to Chicago, bypassing any of the tax requirements. So, it is not good, and, and it, this is an area that really um, upsets me because it makes our business development work very challenging because how do you overcome that $100, $150 per can? And, and on top of that, Commissioner Keller mentioned that the Canadian um, government plays a big role in their port infrastructure because international trade accounts for 70% of their GDP. 
And then as Commissioner Counter mentioned, there are only a handful of ports versus how many ports you just mentioned, just Washington State have 70. You imagine the entire US, how many ports, I never counted them a lot. We're all competing for federal grants. We're all competing for the limited resources. So it makes it a very challenging um, environment for, for Washington and, and uh, for Seattle and Tacoma. Why Wait, is it tax Canada 150 bucks a can? I like to do that. If I, I wanted to call their <laughs> prime minister. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and we, yeah, yeah, no, we, we wanted to level that playing field in a worse way because we feel, we feel that we're being disadvantaged, but you're right, there's fair trade agreement in place that kind of prevent us from going that route. I even thought of, even this morning, I thought about, gosh, I'm going to uh, uh, Vancouver, uh, Mitchell, Vancouver, and I'm going to place an ad in their newspaper and <laughs> say something I probably shouldn't say so that we can get the cargo coming throughout way. It, it is a challenge, and, and there's no question, but thank you for that great question. And you should run for commissioner after she is <laughs> <laughs> I know somebody who works at the Canadian Consulate in Seattle. If you want, I'll, I'll give out their personal cell phone number. You can all can contact them. Oh, only joking. Are there any other questions? I know we're a little bit over time. If not, uh, let's thank our panel for just some wonderful information. Then great job asking the third edge for business should first the world affairs to come up making this all possible. There's over 170,000 people who work in global train supply chains in Washington State. So the work that uh, all these folks are doing on this panel is crucial, not just uh, to our getting goods and buying stuff online, but to all the jobs that are here in Washington State. So let's give her a big, big hand. And I'm, uh, as you're ready to go off into your night, don't forget, I believe on Wednesday, April 24th, there'll be another World Affairs Council program on climate change. Climate change came up in this discussion a couple of times. We'll be able to dig into it even more deeply uh, on April 24th. Registration and details at the website you see there on your chart. Again, I apologize I could not be there in person, but boy, what, what a great presentation by our panelists. Thank, thank you again all, and look forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you, Sam. Um, thank you again um, to our panelists and wonderful, well, our wonderful panelists and the moderator for a very insightful discussion. And uh, thank you everyone for coming to the event and sharing your um, comments and suggestions. Um, if you have previously registered for the event on the website, I think you will get a survey on Thursday and we look forward to get some feedback from you about the event. Thank you so much again.